Uh, there's this Bible verse. It says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to what? Does anybody know it? There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to, shout it out. Any, death. That's right. That's right. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And I, I promise, ladies, uh, this isn't just talking about your husband when it comes to directions. Like this is, it seems right. I know this is the right way. It's like, let's stop and ask for directions. I don't need to. I got this. It's a shortcut, right? You know? Uh, but, but that's not the only sort of thing it's talking about. Really, in our lives, there's a way that seems right to us. There's a way that seems right to us. For most of us, if we're proud Americans, there's a, a right American way that seems to us. But, but in the end, if we stick to our way of thinking and our way, the Bible says our ways end up leading us to death. And, and I want you to see how God steps into this man's story he had his own way, his own mindset, his own thought process, his own way of action. And in the middle of that, God steps in and provides an interruption. Have you, have you ever had that happen to you? Where, where, where you've got one course set out, you've got one plan, and all of a sudden God just puts the brakes on. You know, no, you thought that that's what was going to happen, but instead you're going to do this thing over here. And I, I've always found that when you have God stop you in your tracks and redirect you to something else, his plans always work out better than what your plans would have. Can I get a, a witness up in the house today, right? And so I, I want you to see what happens for Joseph. Look at this story, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And I've got a very simple question that I want you, maybe you just want to take some notes, but uh, I have one simple question that I'm going to ask you in the middle of this story. It has to do with this song. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his, Mary, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And so now we know Mary's perspective of the story. Mary's visited by the angel Gabriel. You saw it in our kids' play. Uh, it, he announces to her that she's going to be uh, the mother of the Son of God. She, How's this going to be? I don't understand. How's this going to happen? I'm a virgin. He says, something very special is going to happen to you. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. This child is not going to be a, a man. So this child is going to be the Lord's. And he's going to be called the Son of the Most High God. And so she surrenders and she sings her little song, Let It Be. She says, let, let it be to me as you've said. And, and, and she takes this this task on. She surrenders to the Lord. And so she finds out she's pregnant and immediately she leaves. And she goes to her cousin Elizabeth's house and she stays there for three to four months. And so after this four month period, she comes back and, and she's starting to show. And, and she can't hide the pregnancy anymore. She hasn't seen Joseph in months. And as she comes back, uh, it's found out that she's with child. And instantly Joseph starts to think in his mind, what in the world is happening here? Like, I don't understand. So now I know why you left. Now I know why you visited your cousin. Now I know why you were away for four months. Like, now I get it. And, and so instantly, can you imagine, he, he's betrothed to this woman, and, and she comes back, and she's pregnant, and she, he knows it's not his. What would you be thinking? What would you be feeling? Now, now, in our culture, we don't really have a betrothal. Like, we have an engagement. You know, when you like her so much, you put a ring on it, right? And then, but, but, but you can break the engagement, and there's really no consequence, right? Uh, but, but in this culture, betrothal was something totally different. So, so parents would get together and arrange marriages. I, I got four girls. I'm just going to say that option looks pretty great to me. I'm just, <laughs> I'll take any dowries you guys have to offer. I, I've told them, I'll pick a way better guy than you will. It'll save you a lot of heartbreak. I'm just saying, I know who you are. I know what you need. But they haven't gone for that yet, but it's all right. But, but, but the parents would arrange the marriage. They would come together, and they would sign a marriage contract. They would sign a marriage contract. These were their public vows. This is before any kind of wedding ceremony. And, and so it was much more than an engagement. It was a certificate of marriage. So the families would come together. They would sign it, and, and they were declared to be betrothed. Now, during that time period, uh, the husband would be getting things ready for the wife. And so you had all of the legalities of marriage and none of the benefits. Doesn't that sound awesome? Right? 
You, you couldn't be together. You couldn't live under the same roof. There was no sexual intimacy. Uh, but you had all the rights and responsibilities of marriage without any of the benefits of marriage. That's what betrothal was. And so literally, if, if you were cheated on during that time period, it was considered adultery. It, you referred to each other as husband and wife, even though you weren't technically living together yet. And so after this betrothal time, you would come together, and then you'd have the ceremony, and then you were officially husband and wife. But, but before that, you'd been living this whole time. So if, if there was a breakup, there had to be a divorce certificate, even though you hadn't actually had the ceremony yet. Isn't that crazy? It, it was a serious thing. Betrothal was something serious. You were entering into this relationship. And so Joseph and Mary, they're betrothed to each other. The parents have arranged it. They've signed on the line. They've stated, we're going to be married. He calls her his wife. She calls him her husband. And, and then in the middle of this moment, uh, she, she finds out she's going to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. She leaves to go to Elizabeth's house. She's gone for three to four months. And then she comes back and Joseph is like, what happened? Now look at what it says. Put yourself in Joseph's position, verse 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, re read this to me. What does it say? Being unwilling to what? Put her to, to shame. He, he resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, now this is uh, in the times where adultery equaled death. It, it, adultery equaled death. And the law of Moses, if even during a betrothal period, if somebody was found to have committed adultery, you could pull them before the magistrate, you can make the case, and then the magistrate would rule, and if they were convicted of adultery, you could put them to a huge public shame, and not just that, they could be stoned to death. I guarantee you it cut down on some cheating, you know what I'm saying? Like in the middle of this deal, he, he knows he's got options, but he doesn't know what he's going to do. And, and so he looks around and he's like, I, I, I really want to be a good guy to this woman. There's no way. There's no way that I'm going to go through with the marriage. Like there's a, this is not my child. I'm not going to raise somebody else's child. I, I could divorce her publicly. I could divorce her publicly. I could divorce her privately. There, there was a couple of options here. So, so he could divorce her publicly, take her before the magistrate. He would sign the certificate of divorce and say the cause was her adultery. And then she would be put to public shame and possibly even stoned to death. But it says he's this good man. Now, I want you to put yourself in his position. Now, uh, how many of you have ever had your heart broken before? Anybody? One person. Man, that's crazy. You got to tell me your secret. I pass it on to my kids so they don't get their hearts broken. But I'm just saying, if for any of you, could you imagine if you've ever had your heart broken? Just put yourself in that place. Like if you were the dumpy or the dumper, whatever it is, you've had your heart broken in this situation. This is him. And he has all these options available to him. He can bring her up on trial. And, and then she can be publicly disgraced. And he'll be able to get out of this marriage with his integrity intact. Or... There's this other option. He can marry her anyway. He's like, I can't do that. And so he settles in his mind. He's going to go with a third option. He's going to divorce her quietly. And so what he's going to do, he's going to get two or three witnesses around. He'll sign the certificate of divorce, but he won't put a cause. I want you to imagine this. He's not going to put a reason down for the divorce so when people see it, they look and say, he's just as responsible as she is. He's willing for the rest of his life. This was a big deal in this culture to bear the mark of divorce. It's not like it is in our culture today. It's not just sort of throw away or whatever. Like this, this was a huge thing. He was saying for the rest of my life, I'm going to be marked with this thing that there's been something I've done that's unsavory. He knew that she was going to have this baby. He was not going to put down a reason for the divorce. And people could have looked at him and say, he got her pregnant. Then he left her high and dry. Man, what a loser. He knew that it would follow him into every other relationship that he ever might have. But he was a just man. And so he says, I I'm resolved. Here's what I'm going to do. I've set my course. I've made up my mind. I'm not going to divorce her publicly. I'm not going to put her to shame. I'm not going to marry her. I'm going with the middle option. I'm just going to call two or three witnesses together. I'm going to sign the divorce certificate. I'm not going to put a cause down, and people will look at me and blame me just as much as they blame her. That's a good man. 
Now look at what it says. Verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. He says, don't be afraid, marry her anyway. She's telling the truth. I know this sounds crazy. This has never happened before. But this is the fulfillment of all of these prophecies from all of the old prophets long, long ago. This child is, is the Lord's child. She hasn't done anything wrong. She hasn't been immoral here. So listen, what you need to do is change your plan. You're set to go this way, and that seems like an honorable thing. But the just thing is to follow what the Lord says, and you're going to marry her anyway. Because this is the Lord's child. Now look at what happens, verse 21. She will bear a son, and you're going to call his name Jesus. Re read this with me. What does it say? For he will what? Save his people from their sins. Now lots of kids were called Jesus back then, right? It's like Joshua today or David or, you know, whatever it is. It's, it was a pretty common name. It was a name that always led to a hope of a promise fulfilled. It was a name that, that meant God saves. And so as people would name their kid Yeshua, uh, as they would name them Jesus, they would look at him and they would pray for the day where God would send someone to save their people, to rescue them from oppression, to rescue them from the tyranny of Rome, to rescue them out of this situation and set up their nation as this nation who would rule over all the earth. They were waiting for the deliverer. And so each little kid that's named little Yeshua, they look at him and they say, I know there's coming a day when God's going to save his people from their troubles. And so the angel looks at Joseph and says, you're going to name him Jesus. Now, now but, but he's not going to save you from your troubles. He's, he's coming to save you from what? Your sins. This is going to be even bigger than you could have imagined. He's not here to come to rule and reign as king and set up one little fiefdom over all the earth with one little nation. This is going to be the king over every king, but he's going to be a spiritual king. He's coming. He's God's son coming to say. There's not going to need to be any other person named Yeshua that points to a future salvation. He is the deliverer. He is God who's coming to save. Now look at what he says. This is crazy. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they'll call his name what? Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is a prophecy that was 800 years old. It was fulfilled in that time with the birth of a, a, a king who would lead people back to God. But he says this is going to be an even bigger fulfillment 800 years later. This little baby is going to be God who's come to live with us. It, he's going to save people from their sins. That's what he does. But who he is is God who's pulled skin on so he can be right here in the same room with you. What an amazing thought. And Joseph has this decision. And, and this is the same decision that all of us have this same Christmas. It's really the decision of our lifetime. And here's the thing. Maybe you just want to jot down this question. I want you to sort of ruminate over it this week. This is the single point that I have for this Christmas. Is your song going to be, I did it my way or I surrender all? When you sing your song this Christmas, when you live your life, is your song going to be, I did it my way or I surrender all? Now, how many of you know who wrote the song, I did it my way? Who sang it? Frank Sinatra. That's right. Old blue eyes, right? There he is, Frank Sinatra. Do you know the story between, behind uh, how he wrote this song? And so it was over 50 years ago. He was ready to be out of the music business. And so he called together this guy named Paul Anka, a Canadian guy, right? He's a singer too, crooner. And so he comes to have dinner with Frank. And Frank says, I'm going to paraphrase because, you know, I don't want to curse in church. But I'm just saying, he, he says, I'm done with this business. 
I'm done with this business. I'm out. I lived through the 50s, and they called me a has-been. All, all of the 50s doo-woppers called me a has-been. I lived through the 60s, and those hippies called me a has-been. I'm done. I, I've had 30 years in the business. I'm out. I want to be done. And so he says, I want you to write me a song that tells people I'm out. I'm done. And so Paul Anka goes back to New York and he writes this song and, and you know the lyrics of it he's like you know I, I did it my way I did it my way it's basically him uh you know doing do you remember on friends like that like that it's like it's like him doing that to everybody around him it's like I don't care what you think of me I don't care if you think I'm a has-been like I've made it I'm my own guy I lived my way I sang what I wanted to sing I lived my life the way I wanted to live my life I did it my way and it was supposed to be his swan song and do you know what happened to him it became one of his most popular songs and so he tried to retire, but then he kept getting bookings. And so every place he went, he had to sing his song that was supposed to be his exit. He would sing it over and over again. And by the end of his life, do you know what he said? He, he sang the song, and each time he would sing it, he said, man, I hate that song. Man, I hate that song. Now, I want you to know, did you know this is one of the most popular songs to be sung at a funeral? I mean, this song is all about being the God of your own life. This song is all about, I'm the one who decides. I'm the one who makes my way. I don't really care about anybody else, what they think or what they do. I'm not going to be like one of those people who kneel down. I did it my way, right? And it's one of the most popular funeral songs on the planet. And do you know he didn't put it as his epitaph on his tombstone? Do you know what he put? Instead, the best is yet to come. He was so tired of the song doing it his way that he had to think of something else to write. And this Christmas, you have a choice. Are you going to sing, I did it my way? Or are you going to sing, I surrender all? This was Joseph's choice. He had in his mind, I'm going to divorce her quietly. I'm not going to put her to public shame. I'm not going to put a reason down. I'll bear the own shame on myself as well. And I'll go and I'll do it my way. And God says, no, 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 no. You, you can do it that way. Or, or you can surrender it all. And people will look at you. And they'll think things about you. And they'll think you couldn't keep your hands off each other and you're a bunch of, you know, immoral people. And so you had to get married early. And she was already pregnant when you got married. And you can surrender it all and raise the Son of God. You can raise as a substitute dad for the one who's father of all creation. Or you can do it your way. You know, really, uh, that... That choice is yours and mine. The, the other song you can sing is I Surrender All. Do you, do you know the story behind this song? It's an old hymn, right? All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. I surrender all. Like it's, you know, the lyrics. It's like the same five words. But they're powerful. And Billy Graham used this over and over and over again in his crusades. This was like the altar call, right? He would say, People are coming. Come, come now. You know, it's like the thousands of people would stream in. It's unbelievable. Like as the Holy Spirit of God would move people and they would surrender everything that they had to Jesus. And in the middle of this, this song almost never happened. This song was written by a guy. His name was, uh, look on the screen there. It's Judson Van Deventer. Okay. This guy uh, in the 1890s, in the 1890s, he was an artist. He had gone to Hillsdale College up in Pennsylvania, and he had graduated and become this art teacher. And he really wanted to become a world-famous artist. And so he lived his life trying to pursue this dream. He was part of a Methodist church. He was starting to do some outreaches and evangelism and tent meetings. Anybody ever been to a tent meeting? And so they, they would bring people in, and they would call people to a revival, and then they'd sing, and they'd preach, and they'd tell people about Jesus and giving their life to Jesus. Well, he... he he was at one of these tent meetings. He had already been a believer for a really long time in his life. And in the middle of this deal, in this tent meeting, he felt like God was saying, I want you to give up your dream. You're, you don't need to be a world famous artist. You need to surrender your life to follow me in ministry and live the rest of your life doing evangelism. He said, like, but I'm not an evangelist. Like, I don't know how to do that. I'm an artist. You sh Lord, do you see the things that I paint? Like, I do that for your glory. I, I teach people how to be creative for your glory. Like, that's my ministry. And God says, no, it's not. 
And for five years, he fought with the Lord. You ever fought with the Lord before? Has he ever told you something to do and you're like, okay, God, maybe I'll do it. Was that, was that you or was that last night's pizza? Right? You know, it's like, have you ever fought with God about something? Well, he fought with God for five years. And, and as he finally came to terms, Lord, I can't fight you anymore. This is what you're saying I should do with my life. And it means giving up my dream. I'm never going to be famous. I'm never going to be an artist that's well known. I'm not going to be able to use these gifts in the same way anymore. But God, whatever you tell me to do, wherever you lead, I'll go. What, whatever you tell me, I surrender it all. And so he wrote, home that night and he wrote the words of this hymn. It's the first ever song that he wrote. And he had this friend who put music to it and he started to do camis. He toured all over England and Scotland and the United States for the rest of his life. And he went to this little small school in Florida and was a professor who taught hymnology. And while he was there years after the courses that he wrote influenced this young farm boy from Charlotte, North Carolina, called Billy Graham, who said that his courses ended up impacting him more than almost anybody's. And Billy would close out almost every crusade with this hymn, this first hymn, that this guy who was an artist, not a hymn writer, who he said, okay, God, I'll just surrender it all. Whatever you want for my life, that's what I'll do. You know, you have that same choice every day. Some of you, you need to make that choice for the very first time. I, I'm not going to be God over my own life anymore. I don't want to do it my way. Some of you, you've already made that choice. You've surrendered it all. But here's what happens every single day. We, we kind of take back our rights. Like in our families, well, I've resolved to do this. It's like, well, yeah, but what does the Lord want you to do? Well, I've resolved to handle my finances this way. Well, I've resolved to do this in this relationship. Well, I've resolved that if I'm angry, I'm going to yell at the kids and have one of the Chevy Chase moments where it's, we're going to have the hap, hap, happiest Christmas since, what, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I had one of those moments yesterday, people. I'm just going to, full disclosure. <laughs> and in that moment, are you going to sing, it's my way? Or are you going to sing, I surrender it all? Look at what Joseph did. Verse 24. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he took her as his wife immediately. He doesn't wait. He doesn't wait for the betrothal period to be done. He takes her home right then. Look what it says. But he didn't know her until she had given birth to a son. What a sacrifice. He wanted it to be made sure nobody could say this was his kid. And he called his name Jesus. Jesus. This Christmas, are you going to sing, I did it my way? Or are you going to sing, I surrender all? Two weeks ago, I'll share this story and close. Two weeks ago, uh, I found out that my aunt was in the hospital. And this was an aunt that um, it was my dad's sister. And uh, we never really saw him a ton growing up. I mean, we were close, but not as close as I was with my other side of the family. We saw him just a few times a year. And uh, there was some, a little bit of family tension, a little, you know, crazy family tension that goes on. No, none of you guys have that, right? No, no family tension with extended family. And, uh, and so there was a little bit of family tension, but I heard that she was in the hospital. I heard it was something sort of serious, and uh, she had coded in the hospital, and she was on a ventilator. And so uh, I, I found out about it on the weekend, and my wife, uh, you know that verse, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. So in my mind, I'm like, well, I'll just wait. And my wife is like, you need to go visit with her and pray with her. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, there's just like a little tension, you know, and I just don't know if they want me to come or be there or not. Like, I, I don't it's down in Pineville. I, you know, it's just like going to be my day off. It's been a really stressful weekend. Like, I just want, you need to go. You need to go pray with her. And uh, any of you guys thankful for women that put you in your place? Like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, some of you need to raise your hand, but I'm just saying. Anyway, yeah. So, so, so in the middle of this deal, uh, I drive down there. I had no clue what to expect. And I walk into the room, and I was worried about, like, this little bit of tension, you know, and sort of some stuff. And, and as I walk into the room, they were starting a procedure where they were going to try to have her breathe on her own for the next 30 minutes. And if she was able to do that, they would pull the tube. They had tried it the day before, and she started... Uh, having really adverse reactions, so they put her back on a ventilator. 
And so I walk into the room right at that moment as they're trying to start the test. And so there was no room for any tension. There was no room for any conversation. Immediately, it was just time for me to pray. And so I stood over in the corner of the room just praying over my aunt. And uh, my, my cousin, who was there, her daughter, um, was just singing to her. And, and so she had this Pandora music on. It was like every song was from God's playlist. It was like the voice of truth tells me a different story. I mean, they were so concerned. Like, if we don't get this tube out today, you know, if you're on the ventilator for a long time, things happen, you know, and it's rare to come out. And so she's singing over her mom, just bending down. It was one of the most beautiful worship services I've ever been a part of. And it was just a few people. And so she's there and she's singing these songs over her mom. And uh, my aunt loved to sing. She loved to sing more than anything else in this world. She loved to sing. And, and so she, you could tell she was like singing in her head. She's partially sedated. And, and so my cousin is singing these songs over and over. And she would start to freak out a little bit. She would start to panic. And she would gasp for breath because she's having to breathe through this little straw for 30 minutes. And if she can do that, they can pull a ventilation tube out. And so as she would start to freak out, my, my cousin would just stroke her mom's hair and say, I know you're singing to Jesus right now. Just keep singing to Jesus. And then she would sing this song over her mom, whatever the song was, over and over again. And, and after 30 minutes, she passed the test, and we were all, like, so excited. You could see, like, this spiritual high in the room. It's, like, one of the coolest worship services that I've ever been a part of. I'm, like, I have my hand on, on her feet like this, you know, and I'm praying over her, and I'm lifting her up, and my cousin is singing over her. There's, I mean, there's no tension now, right? I mean, it's just you realize all the silliness of the past stuff. And, and they take the tube out of out of my aunt, you know her first words? She says, he's not done with me yet. And she looked at her daughter, and she said, I love you so much. And then she grabbed my hand, and she was so glad that I was there. I love you. And so I, we just stood, and we walked out in celebration. We were like, what a beautiful moment. I'm so glad my wife made me come, right? And in the, in the middle of this deal, like, it was so special, so special. Well, we're out there in the waiting room. And then uh, as, as they, they took the ventilator out, um, she started to have some breathing problems again. And um, she coded again. And they tried to get the ventilator back in, and they couldn't do it. And then she coded a second time. And her airway was collapsed. And so they couldn't get the tube back in. And so I was there with my extended family in this little room and they're asking those questions that you never want to ask you know it's like this is this is it like what what do you want done like this is this this is it and uh do you want to keep trying do you want to we, we can't get the tube in like this is really tough and i mean everybody's just crying and i'm, I'm there just you know hugging them just doing what i can and that moment they're like no she wouldn't want that she wouldn't want that and and so they they hand me the phone and i go in and uh as I'm there, uh, I'm supposed to call one of the grandkids and tell them, like, Grammy's going. And, you know, in that moment, I'm talking to the grandkids and trying to calm them down. And they, they ask me to come into the room, and I bring the phones, and there's phones all over the place. And it's all the grandkids on the phone, and they're right there around the bed. And they're like, tell Grammy goodbye. And they're all singing, oh, I love you, Grammy. You're the best Grammy ever. You're amazing. And I'm there in that moment. I'm just, okay, I can't do anything. I'm just praying. I'm just praying. I'm just praying. And my cousin, who was singing before, she's hyperventilating now. You know, she's, this is it, this last moment. And she said, we got to sing. We got to sing. And so she pulls up on her phone at Elevation Worship. And we love their songs. You know, it's like on earth as it is in heaven. You know, and it's like, it's the Lord, like the Lord's prayer. It's like, your will be done on earth like it is in heaven. And, and she's like, we want the last thing she hears to be singing and the first thing she hears to be singing in Jesus' presence. And so, like, I'm there and I just, I can't do anything. I just got a hand on each of them. And I'm just trying to pray. And, and they're singing this beautiful song. Like, you've never heard worship like this, like, from a place of total brokenness. But in the middle of that moment, they're just, she's hyperventilating and she's singing, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And 
and she's just singing over her mom. And they call me, and they're like, can you pray? And so I prayed her into the kingdom. When I finished saying amen, and the song was done, she was gone. And she was in God's presence. And every single one of my cousins hugged me and said, I know without a doubt, it was God's will that you were here today. We could not have done this without you being here. And all the stupid little crazy old you know, family tension, all, that's, all that was gone. All that was gone. And I loved each of them. And I thanked God that that day my wife was smart enough to tell me, don't sing, I did it my way. Sing, I surrender all. And because of that, now there's no family tension. And I got to be a part of this beautiful moment to usher a saint into the kingdom of heaven. And I got to be a comfort for my cousins. Just because that day, instead of choosing my way, I said, okay, I'll surrender to the Lord's way. Also, a.k.a. Katie's way. And, <laughs> and I went, right? I can't imagine what I would have missed out on. If I would have said, no, I, this is my day. This is my, this is my time. I can't imagine what I would have missed out on. I wonder how many opportunities we miss because we've resolved to do a thing. And God steps in and says, no, 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 no. That's if you do it your way. But if you do it my way, if you surrender all, you're doing this. And look at what you'll get to be a part of. I wonder how many things we miss out on all the time. Because we're content to sing the song with all blue eyes. Yeah, but I did it my way, right? Instead of saying, I surrender all. This Christmas, you're going to have a chance to see family members, people that need to know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Are, are you going to do it your way and just kind of skate through the deal and try not to offend anybody? <laughs> are you going to Are you going to say, I surrender all and, and somehow bring Jesus up in the conversation? Like in your relationships, in your marriage with kids, like are you going to say, I did it my way? Or are you going to say, I surrender it all? Listen, surrender it all. You'll never know the joy that you get to be a part of. It's incredible. Sing that song this Christmas. Let's pray. There may be somebody in this house today that doesn't know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And if it was your last moment, if it was your last breath, instead of feeling complete peace, instead of feeling complete peace about where you'd go, you might be feeling complete fear. I don't know. If you're counting on your own good works to get you to a relationship with God, the Bible says that even on your best day, your righteousness is like filthy rags to God. You can never earn your way there. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And nobody comes into a relationship with God. Nobody gets to go to heaven except through Jesus. And so if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to tell you your song you're singing is, I did it my way. And that's what you've been singing your whole life. You've been God over your own life. And today is the day of your salvation. You need to surrender to him. You need to say, I surrender it all. Would you just whisper that prayer to him? There's no magic words. It's not about joining a church or it's not about walking an aisle or getting dunked in water or becoming a member of anything. It's all about you surrendering to Jesus as Lord over your whole life. It's you saying, I'm yours. You're in charge. You're God. I'm not. So would you just tell him right now? Just say, I surrender it all. Just tell him, I surrender it all. And if that's you, I want to celebrate with you. The Bible says that you've crossed over from a destiny of death to a destiny of life. A relationship with him that will last forever because of what he did on the cross. And because of how he came back from the dead. He's alive. And he's given you this gift of forgiveness and a gift of eternal life. I just want to celebrate with you. Would you put down your name and address on your response card? Put your name and address. Put a check box in the top one that says, I prayed to receive Christ. And then just leave it in your chair. I'm going to send you a book in the mail this week about your next steps. Here's what you do now that you know Jesus. But for those of you in the house that you've already met Jesus a long time ago, let me just ask you. Have you resolved to live it your way? What about the things that you let into your eyes? What about the things that come out of your mouth? 
What about the way that you relate to your spouse? What about the way you argue? What about the way that you talk to your children? What about the way that you spend your money? Is he Lord over everything? Listen, this Christmas, don't sing I did it my way. You'll miss out on so much joy. Instead, sing I surrender all. Would you just tell him? Let the Holy Spirit put his finger on one or two areas where you just need to surrender and just tell him, I surrender. I surrender. I surrender the way I've been handling this relationship. Tell him right now, I surrender. I surrender. My finances, I surrender. My thought life, I surrender. What I let come into my eyes, I surrender. What I let come out of my mouth, I surrender. My kids to you, I surrender. My job, I surrender. My outlook on life, I surrender. Whatever it is, just tell them right now. I'm done living it my way. I surrender all. Lord, you've heard our words of surrender. And so we stand and worship you now. And thank you that you've spoken to our hearts. And all God's people said, Amen.